Hi there. I'm Felix Clock, and I wanted to spend a little time demonstrating ways to um, use the Rust compiler to get started developing with the Rust compiler in terms of how to hack on it and how to um, explore ways to change your program in ways to better understand what the compiler itself is doing. So we won't be diving too much today into the internals of the compiler. I hope not to do too much of that. Instead, I want to talk about ways to use the external interface of the compiler, uh, of the Rust compiler, to uh, change your program, or likewise, how to change your program yourself in order to sort of narrow the behavior of the, of the compiler and better understand what the compiler is doing internally. Before I get into the details of how to use the Rust compiler and the ways that you can you know, hack with it, I, I do want to mention that there are office hours associated with this video um, you know, shortly after it's broadcast, initially broadcast. In particular, this is part of a series of videos, and each one is going to have some office hours associated with each one. So this video, the, off, the associated office hours, are going to be on Wednesday, December 28th, and Wednesday, January 4th. Feel free to come to whichever one you can come to. They are, um, I'll, I'll have these specific times available in the video description, as well as information on where to go to join, um, to find out more information about how to get, how to join in with them. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you there. Having said that, let's get into the actual compiler work. As a particular motivating example I want to use today, I wanted to see about this, this very old bug um, from several years ago, where someone had pointed out that there's this oddity in um, the way that the borrow checker works today. So let me see if I can quickly hack up an example of what the person is noting as being sort of weird. So if you today um, make a vector in Rust and then you use um, methods like, uh, you can use methods, there's different, there's different ones available, but I think a standard example that we can use here is there's, there's special case handling in the compiler for doing something like this, where you can mutably push the length of the vector onto the end of the vector. So if I, I'm gonna take my currently built compiler um, that I spent some time building outside of this video, compile that, run it. Oops, <laughs> it would help to actually uh, see what we're doing. Okay, so here, this is you know seemingly an obvious thing, we're taking the length of the vector here and we're pushing it on to the end of the vector. And thus we get start with the empty vector, we push, we get the length, which is zero, we push that onto it and we end with a vector that holds a single element zero on it. If we do that again, um, we will get a vector with two elements on it. The first one being zero from this push and the second one being one from this push. So far, so good. And the odd thing is that if you try then to do this, to overwrite that first element with the same kind of call, up, oh, that was accepted. Okay, that's okay. Right, this one's okay. The problem comes when you want to do this um, instead. Yes, that's rejected. So these three things were all accepted. This line here of pushing the len and, and obviously doing it again is fine. And then this thing was accepted where you do the, you get the element index zero, you get an entry for that point and you push on some value, in this case, the len again. Um, and then here, this is what's rejected. So this is the interesting case. Why is this, re why is this top thing accepted? and this bottom thing rejected. And the quick answer here is that uh, there's something special happening behind the scenes. When we implemented non-lexical lifetimes inside the Rust compiler, we actually didn't initially accept code that looked like this. And the reason for this is that code like this ends up desugaring into something quite a bit different. So this code here, um, what it actually ends up turning into is a call to a method on vector called push, 
where it, the vector method itself, the vector type has a push method on it. And in Rust, you can take methods, methods, even though we have special call syntax for calling these things, like met, like with this dot syntax to call them, and that'll dispatch on the type of the receiver in terms of looking up what the type of that thing is to figure out what method to call. You don't have to do that kind of thing. You don't have to use the dot syntax. You can say, look, I know I'm pushing onto a vector and say I'm taking and this push method takes the vector itself mutably. So you can pass that as a mutable argument here and then pass the thing you want to push onto it. And watch what happens when I do this instead. This is rejected. So there's something funny happening. There's something funny happening where for some reason this top thing is accepted and this bottom thing is rejected. And the answer is that there's something special we have called um, two phase borrows, where essentially the heart of what the problem is here is the reason that we're rejecting this code is conceptually what's happening is that you have this borrow of this V happening here when this expression is evaluated. And thus, that happens first. Rust evaluates arguments from left to right order. And so you're going to start here, evaluate this thing, and that's grabbed the address of V and pushed, pulled it somewhere, put it somewhere, and it's saying, I've grabbed this for mutable access, and I have exclusive access to this thing. And so then you have this other expression here that tries to grab V as well. And the problem is that from the viewpoint, from the somewhat simplistic viewpoint of the borrow checker, You've already grabbed something that says it wants exclusive access to V here. Therefore, it's not valid to grab a different instance of V here. You've already grabbed it for exclusive access here. And so that code's rejected. So if you wanted to look at this another way more explicitly, you could say if you wrote it like this, You can make a pretty solid argument that this is a pretty strange and bad thing to do. You don't want to be able to have a mutable borrow assigned to, uh, held by A and let someone else do a shared borrow of V. The mutable borrow of V was exclusively taken here. A has exclusive access. No one else is allowed to grab it. A is the thing that has ownership. And at best, you could do this. Right, you could, you could, this is totally valid now. This will be accepted by the compiler, I believe. Um, because now what we've done is we've had a mutable borrow, put it in A, and now we're using that mutable borrow to temporarily um, take a shared borrow on A itself and give that to B. And then that borrow ends, and we are able to, the, the, the borrow for the shared borrow that was taken here ends, and now we're able to re keep using A and the integer value we got for B and push that on. So this is, this is fine. This version's fine, but it's not with. But this is not what this top thing, in theory, um, desugars into. Of course, because the difference is that there's a call to v here, this v dot len here. So the point is, this will be rejected, as I just explained, right? And the Rust compiler does a pretty good job of explaining this. It says, look, you can't borrow v as mutable. It's as immutable here. It's already borrowed, borrowed as mutable. This is, this is sort of old hat if you've done a lot of Rust programming. So the really interesting question then is what is going on such that um, this, this bottom thing is, reje is rejected, but this top thing is accepted, right? I've already sort of argued to you a number of times that this thing that I've written is rejected by the compiler. And so the, these two things aren't really equivalent. There's some difference between what's happening with this lower form here. And the answer for what's happening is that uh, in this version, we have special case code in the compiler that says, you know what? For this scenario, we know that in this particular case, we're gonna have this mutable borrow of V here as the receiver for a method call. And we know nothing's going to happen to it in terms of there's nothing special that's going to happen from the point from when the bar was taken to the point where the call is actually made. So conceptually, if you want to look again at this version here, which is rejected, to be clear, you can look at this and see a similar, you could make a similar kind of argument here saying this thing is mutually borrowed, true, but nothing's going to happen with that mutable borrow 
for the entire time that the rest of the arguments are evaluated. And it's and the fact that it's a mutable borrow only matters once we actually control uh, make the call, uh, make the con make the control jump into um, the vec dot push code itself. This is called two phase borrows. It's the, the idea of supporting this this notion that you could have this receiver be mutably borrowed. But delay, it, it's called two phase borrows because there's a phasing where you have the initial mutual borrow where you're saying, I'm putting my stake here to say, I'm going to eventually mutually borrow this thing. Don't move it around. Don't, don't do anything special with it. Um, but I'm not taking exclusive access yet. I will take exclusive access when the actual call to push happens. That's the, insta the intuition behind what is happening with two phase borrows. And thus, this two-phase borrows mechanism is what gives us the ability to um, support this kind of code in the borrow checker. And it's also what gives us the ability to support this kind of code with the index, the index method, index mute method um, does a similar desugaring. So this index, this is an index mute call right here where we have a vec, the vec V and we're gonna actually call, so this what this desugars into to be clear is a call to index mute. Um, on vector. So the index mute, the container index operation on index mute is the index mute method. So we can actually desugar this ourselves here and call this. If we first call it, let's first call it this way to make very clear what, what, what we want to do. We can call index mute on V, passing it the index zero. And that gives back a mutable borrow to the output type of mutably indexing the vector. And this, uh, right, okay, this is an error because I haven't pulled the index mute trait into scope, but we can fix that in our code quickly. Um, I do wrong here. Oh, of course, I deleted this line. We have to keep this line because we need to actually have a vector that's not empty. <laughs> okay, so I'm just demonstrating that this is one way to think of the desugaring of the index mute method. Um, it turns out, though, that this is a way to think about the desugaring of the index mute method, where it's where where it's turning into this method call. And it's very much, and you can see how this looks very much like what we wrote up here. And this top thing is supported. So, you know, there's a pretty reasonable argument to make that this also um, should be supported and is supported as shown by my ability to compile and run it. Um, and the interesting question comes with, okay, well, what if we do a similar desugaring on this formulation here? Because this, remember, was rejected. And I'm realizing now, one thing that might be a little frustrating is I'm, I'm actually manually doing these um, desugarings by hand. Well, but I'll keep going with that, um, actually. I'm just demonstrating First of all, I'm doing a desugaring by hand, but I might be lying to you, is the first thing I'll say. Um, so it's when we try to do this one, it complains. It says you can't do this, it's not allowed. And it, it, it suggests ways that you might try to rewrite the code, although I'm not sure if it does that great a job of, well, it tries, it tries. It's, it's maybe not the easiest thing to read in terms of error messages. Um, it's doing okay though. I don't know. It's saying we want to grab this thing. The the hard part is the, the interpreting what it's actually asking you to do here. It's not the best diagnostic I've ever seen in the compiler. Um, but the point is, let's talk about what's happening here. First, I'm going to show you what you might think the desugaring is based on my earlier claim of what this turned into. So um, I claim that this turned into uh, v dot index mute v dot len minus one 
and then dereference and hit zero. All right. If you believe that this desugars into this, then you likewise should believe that this will desugar into this. So let's see if the compiler, and, and, and thus, if the compiler rejected this, then surely it will reject this. Let's see what happens now. The compiler accepted it. So something is off with my explanation here. Something is wrong with how I'm explaining what's going on in this problem. Because I claimed earlier that this top thing desugars in this thing, this thing desugars to this thing, and if that's true, then this thing must desugar to this thing, and yet the compiler rejects this and accepts this. So it can't be quite right that this is just desugaring into this, right? That doesn't seem like it makes sense in terms of what's being accepted and rejected here. There's something going on such that this call here isn't being accepted by, by um, two-phase borrows, but this top one is. And so the question is, what can we do to figure out what's happening to the compiler so that we can understand the difference between this line and how it's handled by the compiler versus this line? That's the sort of key question I would like to try to resolve um, right now. So in fact, I'm going to simplify this code a little bit, uh, just getting rid of some of the extra things that we had up here for demonstration purposes. And so we should have, in the end, um, a call that looks like this. I'm also gonna get rid of this thing here. We don't actually need us to see the printouts anymore. So with this new version of the code, we should have something pretty small to look at. Um, and we can do things like say, okay, I wanna see, and, and, and as a reminder, again, this is the version that won't compile, right? We see that error message here, okay? And the first question is, okay, well, what's the difference between these two pieces of code? What is actually difference between um, the first thing that works and the second thing that doesn't? And so you can try to answer these questions by inspecting the intermediate representations the compiler emits. The Rust compiler provides um, a rich set of ways to print the different forms of the code. And in particular, you can use the emits method to see, in the stable compiler, you can see the emit method to print out um, the LVM IR that you get. And you can even see the mirror of the, 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 the rusts, the, the final stage that the rust internally uses before it starts generating LVM um, IR is called mirror. There's this whole series of intermediate representations, but the last one is called mirror. And you can ask the compiler to give you the mirror output uh, if you want. So for example, we can say emit mirror here. And what that will do is print out to a file that to be very clear here, this is an output that's just instead for humans. It's not a stable output format. Mirror itself is is currently quite you know unstable. It can change in arbitrary ways. This is just meant for us to sort of inspect ourselves. So we could scan through this to see if we can infer the structure of, of what the code is like. Um, and this isn't bad, it's it's 73 lines of code. So we could look over this and see if we can figure out what's happening. In particular, we can see um, the index mute call. So if you wanna see what the thing we're looking at is, it's this. So we're looking at the place that has an explicit call to index mute. And so you can actually work your way through this code starting from the very beginning and say, okay, it's gonna start by creating the vector in basic block zero. Um, calling vec, vec new, the corresponding to our first line. And then here, it's gonna push the constant zero onto the vector. It first does a mutual borrow. This is an example of the kind of desugaring we see where the um, the vector is stored in local variable one. And so we have a mutual borrow of local variable one, storing that in local variable three. And then we do a put, make the push call moving three onto zero. So this is an example of us seeing um, the kind of desugaring that I showed earlier, where an actual call to the push method passing in the mutual borrow of the vec of the vec v, and then it does another mutual borrow of um, the vector in local variable one, and stores that in five. And here's an interesting thing: this is the kind of thing I was talking about with two phase borrows, where we have a shared borrow, and that goes in local variable eight. And normally this would not be allowed, but it's two-phase borrows that allows this um, there to be this borrow 
of one stored in a five and then have five later be used. Um, if we look later on, we can see that five is gonna end up being used in probably BB4. BB4, yeah, here's the use of five right here. So, thus we have a mutable borrow of the vector here, a shared borrow here, which would normally not be allowed because five is used down here, but two, spa two phase borrow, special cases this thing, and we'll end up um, calling the length method, passing a local variable eight, storing that into seven, the, storing the result into seven, and then um, we do the subtraction of seven minus one because that was part of the code that we were doing where we did length and then minus one on it to calculate the, the index. And then we have um, the move that result and it's um, initial, the, the, the check subtraction. So it's gonna return something that's a structured value that has to be, you have to project out of it to get the actual value out. That's what this dot zero is. And finally, we call index mute passing that local variable six as the thing we're storing and um, local variable five for that mutable borrow we took of the vector that we're storing into. Okay. And that's, oh, sorry, six is not the thing we're storing. Six is the index that we're trying to access, um, the index we're pulling out and getting a reference to. Okay. So the question is then, oh, right. The whole point is that this code is accepted by the compiler. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is just put this, put a copy of this, this code aside. And now we're going to change the code slightly, right? The version of the, that's rejected. And we're going to, you know, remind ourselves it's rejected. And now we're going to call emit mirror on this. Um, up, but did we actually get new mirror? No. Okay. So this, this is an example of where this kind of methodology might fail you. Uh, my plan was to show you the difference in the mirror that was generated, but the stable, but the, the emit command, the compiler actually isn't going to let us do that because it had this borrow check error that fired before we even got to the point where you would have been allowed to emit the mirror. Okay, so what now? And this is where we now have to shift our sort of mental model from the stable options provided by the compiler, right? I was only showing you the ones that were provided by the dash dash help command. Um, and then I found the emit command amongst those. And that gave us a little bit of insight into um, some interesting representations of the compiler. But I think uh, it's now time for us to go a step deeper and say, you know what, what about the unstable options provided by the compiler? And for this, you can use the dash C, if you have your local build of compiler, or if you're using a nightly build of compiler, you can use the dash C help flag to see the unstable options the compiler offers. Um, and there's, there's a lot of them. This is like what? So this is line 2024, 285, and the end it's 492. So um, yeah, that's that's in the order of 200 lines of output there of, of different options. The important one that we want to see is um, the unpretty. So he, this is a sort of historical detail. Um, we used to call the various output formats that I showed you earlier, like we said pretty printing formats. And then at some point, I think it was me who added the unpretty variant that, that said, okay, we're going to have certain like more raw versions of the source that will include and we'll call them unpretty because they aren't guaranteed to be pretty at all. And we kept that name unpretty even after we got rid of the um, stable pretty, the supposedly stable pretty um, printing outfit, uh, output format and just made them all unpretty. So the question now is there's these other unpretty forms. What can these tell us about the code that we have? So I'm gonna take a step back again we're going to look at that code. Um, let's take a look at the code as it stands in this form with this bad, you know, misbehaving version. So the various unpretty forms are these normal, identified, you know what I'll do? I will actually, um, yeah, that's fine. We can, we can, we can work through these. So 
let's start by just saying what happens if you say unpretty equals um, unpretty equals normal, right? What's going to happen now? The first thing is it doesn't print out to a file now. It prints the standard output. And all this does is just prints out the text that we got for the most part. This is like a source preserving format um, that uh, isn't that interesting probably. The next format you can see is the identified format, normal identified. And what this tries to do is it tries to print, um, in, a, in an ideal world, this would give you, give you inf interesting information for the different parts of the source code in terms of having distinct identifiers um, for each one. However, um, this clearly isn't interesting because it's assigning the same number to every single thing that is printing out here. So that's, that's not quite right. Um, these, these annotations are in comments. The idea is that you should be able to take this code and recompile it and all the annotations are going to be ignored. So these, these little numbers are all inside of comments here that have been injected by the, by the output printer. So, okay, um, identified isn't actually interesting, uh, but it will get interesting later. Um, so expanded, this is the form of, that you get when you say, okay, I want to see the macro expanded form of this code. Um, there's nothing interesting here for the most part, except for some preludes that have been added. Why is that? It's because uh, our code didn't have any macros in it. If I put back the debug call here, then we'd actually see something interesting. Namely, the debug call expands into a surprising amount of code. Um, this is what the debug call turned into. It does a match on the V, and then it binds that to a temporary, and then it calls this, this ePrint method and makes these calls to... Uh, these various routines to format the output. And this is not that surprising because the debug format is, is you know, got a lot of information in it. It's got uh, like the, the name of the, the file that we printed. If you don't remember what it looked like, the, the debug output format, uh, oh, right, I have to use the code that compiles to demonstrate this. The debug output format looks like this. It's got, you know, interesting stuff in it. And so it's not that surprising that when we do unpretty expanded on it, that it expands into a fair amount of stuff. It's trying to do nice printing of things like the string for the, for the file name and likewise um, give you nice debug printing of the argument itself, um, in terms of the V itself rather. It's passing along various format specifications to specify how those things should be printed. Um, a simpler form that I think will probably print out into something slightly smaller would be maybe this, maybe. Let's just find out quickly. Yeah, this is much smaller. So println expands into just these calls. So this a print call with these two um, subroutine calls and some in intermediate array constructions. Okay, so those are examples of how expanded works where that does macro expansion. And now if I do expansion identified, I get this form. And now this is where the identified variant becomes interesting because now those intermediate AST nodes um, post expansion now have unique numbers associated with them. So these are ways that uh, the compiler internally identifies the different nodes in the tree that forms the abstract, abstract syntax tree. Because internally, it's just an array of data and it references itself by using these numbers internally. Um, so these are literally indexes into an array somewhere within the compiler and or some sort of map. I believe it's still an array somewhere in the compiler. And the, the crucial point, though, is that these numbers are used in various places to identify the points in the abstract syntax tree um, for referencing purposes like in spans and whatnot. Okay, so that was another example of an unpretty format and still not one that actually tells us much about the difference between our code though because we're still, um, our source code is mostly, stay, is basically staying the same in terms of being able to understand the differences between those two output formats. Let's, let's keep going though. Let's see what other unpretty formats we might be able to see. Um, so there's AST tree and AST tree, tree expansion. I think these are just lower level formats for looking at the AST. The AST. It's not interesting from our, for our purposes, I don't think. 
Um, so yeah, this gives us more like the structured view of what the compiler sort of internally represents, how the compiler internally represents the AST. I mean, it might be curious to look at this if you are interested in learning about how the parser maps that source code into some structured data. But again, I don't think it's going to answer our immediate questions that we're trying to pose for ourselves today. Um, okay, next, after AS, AST tree and AST tree expansion, I'm going to skip that. AST tree expansion, I'm just going to skip that, yeah. Um, let's try the here. So the here, even this, um, actually isn't that interesting here. It's, it's a... Uh, Still high level enough, I think. Although, let me try. I say this, but you know what? Let me see what it looks like if I feed it this now. If I feed it the one that was rejected, does this do anything interesting? No, it doesn't. This is still um, presenting us with this form. Okay. So, I, was th I wasn't sure, uh, to be honest with you, um, what, this, what that was going to look like. Um, okay, so when does it get de 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 decoupled, when does it get mapped down to something uh, more interesting? So is there a way for me to see the fear? The, the THIR is perhaps what I was hoping to, I was hoping to see some form that would give us the desugared form of these things. Um, ah, fear tree. Okay, so there is a form called fear. Um, that's in between mirror and um, between the mirror and the here, but for some reason the documentation for dash z unpretty doesn't mention it in the actual help output. But if you do it wrong, if you um, <laughs> if you pass an invalid value, then it does actually tell you about the other options here. So let's try. Uh, well, first, actually, first I'm going to try here tree to see. Oh, yeah, that's that's a lot of data. Much like AST tree, that's a lot of data. Uh, I don't feel like trying to make sense of that, I don't think. Um, I, I had this sort of vague hope that maybe we'd like to see something interesting, but it's too big to, to wade through. Um, but is theater tree going to be similarly big? Is it going to be a similar waste of time? We'll see. Um, let's give it a try, nonetheless. No, the fear tree is rejected um, because it complains. That's very interesting. Why I would have thought at the point where it would do unpretty fear tree, it wouldn't have run the borrow checker yet. That's unfortunate. That's really curious. Okay. Um, well, this means that we're not going to be able to use, I don't think, any of these print routines to understand the internals of what's happening here. And that's okay. This is, uh, I, one, it's an opportunity for me to like dig in and see if there is a way to, to extend the internal printing systems to give us this information that we want to see. Because um, we still haven't answered our question of what is the difference between what's happening inside the compiler between this form and this form. But there are more tricks up one sleeve that one can use to try to dissect these problems. So I'm gonna take a break right now. Um, hopefully I'll come back later, um, or maybe I'll post this video as is. Okay, so a moment ago, or okay. So we had just found that we had gone through all of the unpretty forms and <laughs> unpretty mirror didn't work for the case that we were interested in, in terms of this, this code. Um, because of the error that it encounters, it unpretty fails to process it. It says, uh, there's a compiler error. I'm not going to even print out the pretty printing that you've requested. But there is another way to um, literally dump the output from into the compiler internals. In particular, another dash Z flag that's relevant here is uh, the dump mirror flag, which will dump the mirror itself, will we'll print out the mirror itself uh, to a file. So unlike unpretty, which prints out stuff to the to the standard output, dump mirror um, generates output to files. And it, it generates it to files because it generates, it might generate a lot of, you know, code for more things than you might expect. 
So the point is, let's see if dump mirror succeeds in giving us something. Uh, so we have to give it a string um, because the reason for that is that there's a series of passes that mirror does. And this is actually gonna be triggering for um, you know particular passes. And so it's a way of saying, look, I only want to see um, certain passes or certain functions uh, in this output. So let's give it a, a shot of just saying, of saying dump mirror all and see what happens. So it may seem like we got the same results as before. I just ran dump mirror all and once again, we got our compiler error. Okay. But the thing is that now inside of this, inside of this directory, um, I know this is the first time I've done an LS. You, you all don't know what was here before. <laughs> all this stuff was here before, so that doesn't help you at all. Um, the mirror dump directory, you know what? Let me um, do this a little more clearly. The mirror dump directory, <laughs> it was just generated. Um, yeah, see, this is the stuff we're doing right now, right? Demo index, okay. And mirror dump was just generated just now. And so we can go inside the mirror dump directory and we see a, a bunch of files. Um, corresponding to the different points, the different transformations that have been done on the mirror. And the point I'm making here is that we can see uh, the different stages for, uh, well, the point is we can see what the mirror looked like, period, right? Even for this code that was rejected. I honestly, every time I look at this output, I always think to myself, I they, 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 do, they do this thing where they say, these numbers in the file names that correspond to sort of the order in which these things are being generated. But then there's this bunch at the end with these dashes. And I never remember like where these fall in the ordering, if they're earlier or late. Um, let's, um, let's go ahead and just look at the very first one in the directory. So it's got more output than what we saw initially, right? There's a whole, there's a bit more information about type annotations compared to what we saw in the, uh, if you remember what the mit mirror output looked like for the case that worked, um, or rather, the, uh, sorry, the unpretty mirror. Uh, no, it was the, well, no, there was the, uh, the, the emit mirror. There was a mit mirror that we looked at, right? And that looked, oh, right. I don't had its own, that had its own thing, um, its own file again, right? This looked like this. It, no, there were no type there were no type definitions in this output because it was just focusing on the, uh, the mirror structure itself. So already we can see a difference where this has some type annotation information that it's supplying. Um, but actually the output looks not, not that dissimilar from what we were just talking about a moment ago, right? You can, you can see the literal uh, alignment between these things. And so scrolling through this quickly, um, is it roughly the same length as before, for example? Because this one is, like 73 lines. Nope, this thing's uh, a bit longer. It's 178 lines. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit longer than what we had before. And I'm, and, but we don't yet know if that's an artifact of, um, I don't yet have an explanation for you why that is. It's, it's, I mean, I do internally, uh, but I'm not going to try to get into it. The point is that there's differences in the output <coughs> from what we saw before. And the, you might be wondering, well, is that because of the differences in the source code that we're looking at, right? The whole point is we're trying to find the differences in the source code. And the easiest way for me to demonstrate that, no, it's not just the difference in the source code, that the mirror dump is fundamentally like, you know, looks different. The easiest way for me to demonstrate that to you is to just say, look, let's, um, let's do two mirror dumps, right? Let's do a run where we dump. So first to be very clear what we're doing, I'm going to delete the old mirror dump, and then I'm going to um, run this code, run the compiler on this code saying dump mirror again, um, right, we're gonna do dump mirror all. And now I'm gonna move the mirror dump into, um, um, one, a, uh, another directory. And I'm gonna put this here instead, do another mirror dump. It gets rejected. Um, okay, so now I've got two mirror dump directories. I think, yes. Okay, and so I can actually compare these things. I can take a look at the mirror dump that came out of, right. So in particular, now that the code is being 
compiled all the way through. So, okay, one immediate difference between these directories is they have a lot more files. There's a lot more files in the one that actually compiled all the way through to the end. Why is this? Because the code that was rejected, the code that broke, only shows the mirror up to the point where it got to the function that broke and then it said, okay, I'm done now. I can't do anything else. The compiler's, you know, done. Uh, the compiler stopped, it, it hit an error. The one that worked, it got to compile a lot more things. And so we see that reflected in the code that's generated because now we see, for example, um, mere dumped output for other functions that get emitted. For example, for the, um, the raw vec methods and uh, and other and vec methods and, and so on, um, because there's various things that get called by the vec destruct the vec destructor when it gets dropped ends up generating a bunch of code that turns into mirror that has to be compiled and that's reflected here, okay. But what I care about is the difference between the demo index files that we were just talking about. So we have our worky case and our breaky case. And we can do a diff on these files. They are big enough that I don't want to just try to like, you know, do it by raw site. Um, and this is not interesting. These differences are just differences in spans. It's claiming these are, okay. Um, yeah, I, I probably could have done a better job of ensuring the spans were the same between the two files but I didn't take the time to do that. And so now I have to take the time now to like sort of um, work around this. That's interesting. I thought there'd be a difference between these two and yet I haven't seen it. Um, that's really interesting. If the mirror itself doesn't reflect the differences here, that's sort of unfortunate. Um, because I was assuming we would see it reflected in the concrete code here. Otherwise, it's really hard to debug the differences between these things. Am I wrong about what happened here? I don't think so. Let's look at, um, just to be sure, let's jump into one of the other ones. In particular, let's look at this one. Oh no, that's NLL is NL. That's why it's a different thing, maybe, because it's, um, well, no. No, 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 it's fine. I mean, it's not fine. This is the reason that this is different, because it's got all this information about NLL in it. Um, okay, and let's just do a quick dip of these two. No, again, um, I think it's just spans. Okay, this is something for me to look at uh, independently, I think. All right, well, I will come back to this um, after I get a chance to sort of dig in more and figure out what's what is where my understanding is going wrong here. Okay, so I've had a little bit of time to, to you know, talk to some people about this and poke a little bit more. So the first thing, the first thing I'm going to do is, is something I should have done in reaction to something we saw earlier. I, I, I did the right thing, I think, in terms of doing a diff between these files. But as soon as we started having a lot of noise in the output, in terms of seeing a bunch of... To be clear, what I'm talking about here is I'm running this diff command between these two files to see um, differences between them. But the problem is the output is... Um, has a lot of diffs that are just differences in um, details about the file line and column numbers for the particular pieces of code that are being uh, run in terms of, because if you look at the original things we were comparing, uh, which was um, this demo index file, I was just, all I was doing was commenting, uncommenting and commenting these two lines. And that meant the role of like a V here and the V.len here, even though they're meant to have the same role in terms of what they do in the code, in particular, this V.len minus one expression, they're supposed to have the same, uh, you know, role in the overall code, but their spans are totally different. And thus we get differences in the output because the output is trying to be nice and tell us information about the spans where the stuff came from, but it actually makes doing diffs hard. 
the right reaction to a situation like this, well, the right is, is irrelevant. Uh, is, the right is, is uh, subjective, but a, a simple thing we can do, and sh I should have done in reaction to that realization that the diffs had noise in them when they span differences, this code is really fast to compile. The right thing to do here is to actually try to make the spans the same. Uh, so in particular, what we can do is we can say, look, we got these two things happening, uh, and there's a v dot len minus one, right? And if we want to make this very clear, we can even just add a little bit more space. And there's this equal zero, and that's that's really all it is, right? This, the, there's going to be changes, of course, in terms of this. The, these things change, and that can't be helped. The the v and the uh, native index operation here, the, the the and versus the the method called the index mute method, right? That's those are differences in the source code. Those spans have to change, but these spans don't. And so if I just do that, and I switch the lines, so if I make this the one for the the breaky case when the native index code breaks, and if I change it to this for the worky case, so that the crucial thing being that the span of v len minus one should always be line seven, column 18 through line seven, column 29. If I go back and do this, this here, line seven, column 18 through line seven, column 29, right? So let's, let's try that now. Let's try being a little bit more disciplined and um, doing a very similar thing to what we did before in terms of there's no mere dump thing right now, it's mere dump worky and mere dump break. Um, so let's, this is gonna be the break case with the index thing. So let's compile it um, and then move mere dump into mere dump. Well, I guess I have to delete the old mere dump break and the old mere dump worky. Okay, this is the break case. And then let's change the code so that this is the worky case and we're just being very careful to ensure that the spans now are more comparable, okay? And after doing this, I'm hoping that uh, the differences will be more apparent in the output. So let's also start from um, the first main function that we had before, just to see what that looks like. So we have and the theory here is that this should be very, very narrow to um, very few diffs. There are still some diffs because there are some spans that had to change. We talked about that before, but um, but I'm hoping far fewer. And I think the other thing we found last time was that the code for this, for built after mirror, whatever, whatever reason, the code at this point um, looks uh, equivalent from, from what I can tell for some reason. So, but when we looked at the code, what it was in the NLL one, that was when we actually saw some differences. And so now what I'm hoping to do is see, um, wait, no, NLL. I'm hoping to see more significant, significant differences. Still some, some differences, of course. But now, okay, this is not just a span that's different. This is something else. Here we see a call argument that's different, right? Um, and likewise, if we get down to it, some, some span differences, again, could, can't be helped. But it's only there, that's funny. Um, it's not reflected in the code at all. That's very interesting. Um, that's that's really fascinating to me. Okay, nonetheless, um, this is something interesting and 
I'm not sure where else to go with that. Um, other than to just note that, okay, the, the mirror is not as different as I expected it to be. So we haven't gotten an answer yet to our core question, and that's okay. Sometimes these experiments fail, um, and we're probably going to have to do a little bit more, a different kind of investigation entirely. So I think the next step here uh, will be to uh, try investigating the compiler itself in terms of adding some, um, either changing the debug output for these, the dump output for these, these things, or leveraging the compiler's internal uh, logging machinery, the Rust-C log uh, environment variable. Um, and what I'm going to focus on is uh, taking a slightly different tack than what I had planned. Let's, let's focus on how to change the compiler, to actually make an edit to it to try to improve the output that we're seeing right now. Um, because right now, I am not seeing the output that I was expecting to get from the mirror, the dumps of it. And so I want to like explore, you know, ways that you to, 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 to edit it to, to see this output. Um, so in particular, the the thing I'm interested in seeing is there's some state inside of the mirror. And to, to remind you, the, the problem here is that um, is that I've got this mirror output that I'm generating. Uh, for this little demo that I've been playing with. Um, and in particular, I want to be able to see the, rel the, 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 the state of this two-phase borrows business. And I already sort of explained what the idea of two-phase borrows is in that there's conceptually a borrow happening if this if you uncomment this code here there's conceptually a borrow happening right here a mutable borrow and yet we'll wait to, we'll, we'll sort of reserve it but we won't activate it until later because we want to be able to have the time to do the evaluation of this argument here and do this shared borrow of b and then invoke the actual call and so what i want to do now is first identify where the two-phase borrow state is even stored in the compiler and then change the mirror output that we get, even from mirror dumps, because the um, part of the whole problem here is that the output isn't indicating, uh, isn't reflected in the mirror dumps that we have from inside the compiler. So how can we figure out how to make a change like this? Well, the answer is we'd have to figure out where the mirror dump is happening. And I think the easiest way to do this is to say, okay, there's that flag that we emit to set, to say we wanna do a mirror dump, dump mirror, and then it has these various settings, right? Dump mirror. Um, and so the first thing we can do is we can actually just grep for the, the now you might be tempted to just grep for dump dash mirror itself as a raw string and say, do it in all Rust code inside the compiler. And that will print something. Um, in particular, it gives you a bunch of references to put where police three people say, hey, there's this dump mirror thing you can use. Um, but you'll notice it's all in comments. There's nowhere in the actual raw text that you see the string dump dash mirror occur. You might be wondering why is that? And the answer is, I can tell you the answer is because this particular string is encoded in a macro um, within the compiler. So there's somewhere in the compiler that, so this is a, a, a kind of pattern you might need to prepare yourself for where, you know, if you don't, if you first don't succeed, right? If you don't, if you don't, if you're doing a simple search like this, and this is only one way to do this kind of search, there are other ways you could go about this, like stepping through the code or using Pronosco. But um, assuming you're doing it like this and you do a first step and you say, oh, I don't see it anywhere. Well, the, the right answer or one answer is to say, okay, it's not the obvious thing. It's not just got dump dash mirror somewhere in the text. And you might have to be a little more creative and say, I bet there might be something happening where there's some smart business inside the compiler that is um, handling these options. And so you could instead, for example, say, where is another option handled? And um, look for that instead. We already saw inside of the code here um, for dash C help. There's all these different options that are on here. And I think the only problem there is that a lot of them have dashes as well. And so this problem that we have that, that 
they're either short words like fuel that might or might not also occur in the code base independently of its use um, in this context of this debugging stuff. Although I'll be honest, I think it actually doesn't occur quite that often. Uh, it's, it's a fair, there's a fair number of occurrences of it. Um, or there are other things with dashes, in which case this same problem where the dashes are messing up our attempt to search. So that's the sort of problem. Um, I will tell you right up the, the bat that you can just, you could just try searching for the word dump or the word mirror. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another approach and say, let's see if there's another word somewhere in here that's not, doesn't have a dash, um, and is rare enough that we wouldn't expect it to occur too often inside the compiler. Let's say, uh, the word deduplicate here. That seems like a word that probably doesn't occur that often, I hope. Um, I'll search for it in all Rust code. Okay, and it occurs actually more than you would think. Okay, you know what? I'm going back to fuel. Fuel is a better choice. So searching for fuel in all Rust code. And to be clear, I don't recommend grepping for random text as like a general strategy. It's actually not that effective, but there's cases where it can get you started. Um, and in this case, the reason why I know that it helps here is because there's this options code that we use to parse the options given to the compiler. And I know off the bat that this thing, um, the way it works is it's a macro called options. So it's um, it defined somewhere. I, I don't even know where the definition of it is, to be honest with you. Um, but the point is that it's a macro and the way it works is it will automatically turn these identifiers into um, the corresponding uh, piece of state. In, in this case, it's both a field on the unstable options struct. That's what this macro is doing. It's defining a struct called unstable options. Um, and then each one of these is both turned into a field in that struct, but it's also turned into the string that it's going to match to, you know, in the dash Z option. And then when it does that string matching, it's going to use dashes instead of um, underscores. So we did a search for fuel, but of course we're not looking for fuel. We're looking for dump mirror. That's here. And now we see, I'm now reminded the other strategy we could have used here is to search for the help text that we saw emitted. Cause that's another thing that's, you know, embedded in the, in the source somewhere. So we could have searched for that and found the same point in the code. So, okay. Why are we doing this? Because we want to know the piece of state that's used um, to track whether to do this or not, so that we can now look for references to it. Um, so we can say LSP find references here and it'll uh, LSP, I'm using Emacs, but this is the same as like final references in any typical ID. We're using Rust Analyzer um, as indicated here, and it's hooked into LSP in my editor. So the language server protocol in my editor, so that we can do searches for things like um, the occurrences of dump mirror. There are actually are not that many occurrences of dump mirror. And in fact, um, this one isn't relevant at the very bottom. Um, it's just something that's um, trying to avoid doing expensive computations. And likewise, this one is just from a test. So that's not what I want. This one is the one we want in terms of we can now see this is how, if dump mirror is set to anything at all, if it's not none, then um, we're gonna go through and say, okay, what are the filters? And that'll all apply down here. The crucial point is now we know, okay, this dump enabled is in fact the function that we want to look for. So if we want to find the reference to this, we see all of these. And so now we can see there's places where dump enable is called. Um, and there's, it seems like there's two main ones. There's the place here where we can do the dump enabled for NLL. Um, and it's where we'll dump the mirror results here, calling dump mirror right here and you can see this is like where the output is generated they remember that output that we were looking at earlier um where we saw um this kind of output right um where it says free region constraints right that's that's something we'll see somewhere in here i assumed Maybe not. Maybe there are no closure region requirements. Never mind. 
Um, there's other things. I assume there's other stuff that's going to be inside this, though, for region, region mapping. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, the region context probably has it, though. Yeah, okay. So I'm just sort of reconstructing my knowledge on the fly as I walk through this. And so the point is that we can walk through enough of the code to see some stuff here about how the stuffing happens. And the thing I want to know about is two-face borrows. Um, in particular, I want to see the part of the state of mirror that is going to capture two-face borrows. So the compiler has the definition for mirror itself. There's sort of one crate that has a whole bunch of this stuff that's sort of shared a, a bunch across a whole bunch of things, and that's inside the middle, the rusty middle crate um, is where we'll see a lot of these things shared. And now if I look in here, um, you can see that there's this thing where two-phase occurs only in only one spot. This allows two-phase borrow thing about the borrow kind. Where is the borrow kind used? Um, the core change I wanted to make, which was to um, have this borrow kind be reflected in the uh, output that we produce, because that's the only place where two-phase borrows are relevant. In particular, I want to know where this this particular case, um, where borrow kind mute is used. Um, and the answer is there's lots of patterns where we match for it, but where do we construct it? Um, everywhere that you see this dot dot here is a clearly a case where it must be a pattern because it's not it's not feeding any data to, to, to create the thing. Here's one place where we create it. Um, or no, this is still a pattern match though, because this is an if let. So even here it's not that's not a construction either. Um, is there a construction somewhere else? So let's keep working our way down and seeing. Here's one, places conflict. This is um, a construction of a borrow kind mute, but it's a helper function asking if a place conflicts with a mutable borrow. Um, so it's not really creating data in the mirror that has two phase borrows turned on. Um, and then here, we have borrow as being turned into unique borrow captures. I think, in fact, I want to narrow my scope now to the cases where allow two-phase borrow is set to true. Um, so I want to look for things where two-phase borrow is given true. Oh, that's the only one? Is there a place where two-phase borrow is set to true? Huh. Um, okay. I didn't think that was the kind of thing that I was expecting to see. Well, let's see. What is this? Where is this called? We already go over this. Hmm. Okay. My strategy here, it's really failing me. I thought we were gonna find something useful, but I'm not getting it. Uh, let's go back to this. There's all these places where we say we don't allow you two phase borrows. There's only one place here, here where it says we do allow it. Is my, hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe I'm not thinking correctly about where borrow kind is used. So 
let me go back and think about this in terms of where borrow kind more generally occurs. It occurs for references. This is what I remember from, from when I spoke to Ollie earlier. They pointed out that borrow kind is basically used for these references, which are um, here under, as part of R value, R value ref. So basically there's cases where you can create an R value ref and the borrow kind will say that it's a mutable borrow, that it's a mutable borrow that, that allows two phase borrows. Um, and what did we do here? What, how do, when did we ever create a case that, that R, where R value ref is uh, saying it allows a two phase borrow? And because I'm at this point, you know, continuing to be somewhat distrusting, um, I'm going to do a raw grep instead of trusting the rest analyzer output because I want to see all the cases. Um, and once I do that, now this is not a perfect grep because it might, the thing I'm looking for might be on a different line, but to start, yeah, no, I'm not seeing anything. But this doesn't make sense. Let's try that again, but this time let's grep for allow two phase borrow. Did I already do this once? What's this? See, this is a different a different thing here. Where this is this now this allow two phase thing in the source code somewhere. Um, so maybe that's partly why I've been confused. So let's jump there. Um, all right, so this is a yes, no enum. Um, and So there's only a handful of places where this is done. There's um, here in try coerce, this try coerce call. Um, there's here where we have method call receivers. Uh, two phase borrows there. We have here, where we are doing a overloaded binary operator. We have here, where we are doing a, again, an overloaded binary operator. Okay, this is, this is an assignment case. And this is It's just, it's just adding, it's just doing multiple kinds of borrows, um, multiple borrow expressions, I'm just saying that each of them are allowed to do two-phase borrows. And that's that's it. Um, ah, this is probably what I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. Why didn't this come up before? Did it come up before? It did come up before, and I just got confused. It came up before because in the grep that I was doing, okay, this was, I was overlooking this case before when I did the earlier search because um, I was I was not being properly um, thorough in my analysis because I went and said, well, when I did a search for every occurrence of allowed two-phase borrow, I looked at these this list and I saw this case right here. But I said, well, when I saw it, I said allow two phase borrow, but it's just mapping to allow two phase borrow. No, wait, it's not that case that I care about. Um, it was the match of allow two phase. It was this one. I saw this and I said, well, 
whatever this is doing for the right hands for assigning this field, because it highlights it, highlights the field. And this is the field that's being assigned. But I looked at it and I said, well, whatever it's doing, it's matching another occurrence of a two-phase borrow. So surely, and I even noticed that there was, uh, but I didn't look carefully. There was no, occur I looked at this and said, well, surely it's matching another occurrence of the same field that's been demapped, that's been destructured up above. But that was false. And it would have, LSP would have, they, the fine references would have told me if there was such a thing. They would have been in the output here. So that was a total miss on my part in terms of reading, uh, reading the output here like an expert. So, okay. We actually can see allow two face borrows here being constructed and it gets passed through by this allow two face borrow that itself is attached to the allow borrow mutability state, which is in a different part of the code base. So allow borrow mutability is part of the fear or the make, no, it's part of the, part of the tie. Um, but still it's, it's, I don't know where it's used. It could be used in lots of places. Auto borrow. I mean, it's, it's part of the tie structure is the point. Okay. Um, so what does this tell us? It doesn't tell us anything yet, except that I know that this borrow kind mute seems relevant for our values in the mirror. And so when I dump this information, I want to uh, think about printing it out. And the borrow kind today, look at that. It's entirely ignored. This is our problem right here. That the borrow, the borrow could be, um, the fact that it's two phases just ignored. And map to the same kind of thing, just mute over here. Um, so I think the answer here might be to uh, start printing out the fact that it's a two-phase borrow. So let's do this. Um, I think the way I want to handle this is to actually go ahead and make this change. So what we can do is we can say allow two-phase borrow. If allow two-phase borrow is false, then go ahead and keep doing the old path. But but otherwise, if we have a borrow kind mute and allow two phase borrow is set to true, uh, then in that case, we'll still want to print mute, but we'll also want to include the fact that this was a, a two phase borrow. So the question is, where's the best place to put that information? Um, I'm still there, I'm going to put in a comment, but I want to know should I go before or after the mute in practice? Uh, it's hard for me to predict without looking at this more, more, um, carefully. I think, I think in practice, well, does it matter that much? Let's do it that way and see, because the other option is to do it, um, with the mute coming first this following, which is, I guess, matches what is what ha sort of what happens up here, this TLS thing. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering if there's any other con any other con uh, precedent to look and in inspect here. There's not. Um, so, okay, let's do this this way for now. And actually, you know what? I can see where the kind strings are printed to get a better idea. So yeah, the kind string is going to end up being, there's going to be a region and then the kind string and then the place. And so the question is, what do you want in practice? Do you want to know, do you want to have a region and then allow two phase and then the fact that it's mute or do you want to put the mute? Do you want to have a region and then the mute with the annotation that's allowed two phase? Um, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think the way to go here is, is to do it this way. The other question should be should it be shorter. Like the other way to go here is to put TBP for two phase borrow and just do that. Does that look cleaner? Um
I kind of like this actually. Let's do that. All right. So, all right. That took me a long time to, to bike shed live about how to encode that. So now we're going to build the compiler again. Um, I should have done keep stage one. This is, this is what burns me. I, I forgot to keep stage one. Okay. That's all right. Um, It's funny that we distinguish between unique and mute in the here in the code here, but we don't uh, include that in the output that we get. Yeah, we have shallow. That's the same thing. Okay, the code finished compiling. So now let's go back and use this new code to. Um, See what happens now when we dump the mirror. So we're gonna go back to our example. Okay, this is the uh, the breaky case. So let's build it, dumping all the mirror, and then move the dump mirror into. Let's delete the old breaks and works and move the new mirror dump into mirror dump break, because this is the breaky case. And then we will replace the two and rebuild. And then move the mirror dump into mirror dump worky. And then we will open them both up and take a look what they look like now. Okay. So let's start at the beginning. This time I've got I've got a good feeling about this one. Maybe. Let's take a look at it. Um, so what I'm looking for is the occurrence of that two-phase borrow thing. Aha. I see it. And oh, it's also here though. But there, there's the difference. That's what we've been looking for. Okay. So now we see an actual difference in the code. Now we don't know where it comes from yet. We haven't quite gotten to that point. And I think that's going to be part of what we uncover by looking at the fear when we get to that stage of things. Um, after I figure out how to dump the fear in a way that we can look at. But at least now we've learned how to um, inspect the compiler and actually modify it to, to meet our needs when there's some piece of state that we want to extract how to identify the piece of state and how to modify the dumping routine to emit that state. Um, so, are there any other changes of notes? I think the rest are gonna be span changes. Yeah, so the relevant thing is right there and we found it. Okay, and that's, I'm happy with that. All right, thank you for watching. And um, I will, probably maybe follow up on this some more with a, a fix to maybe I'll see if I can fix fear to be printed out even when there's a borrow check error. We'll find out. As a reminder, there are uh, office hours associated with this video. We'll be having office hours on December 28th and on Wednesday, January 4th as well. Um, and so the information about how to learn about those office hours in terms of the, the specific times and uh, how you can join in with them, that'll be in the video description. Um, and you'll figure out how to learn more about that from looking there. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for watching.